Welcome Mentors Collective. So if you're a business owner or an entrepreneur, you've probably neglected legal in your business once or twice. I know that I'm guilty of this. In fact, I have a co-founder, Scott Bartnick, who loves this stuff. So he's the one in charge of the contracts, reading everything that comes by our desk, drafting new agreements. And what I've learned over the course of my business career is not to underestimate the importance of a good contract and of reading everything that you sign. So for this episode, I brought a very special guest. He's an attorney who specializes in tech law and artificial intelligence. Robert Scott is the founder of Monger, which is a contracts as a service solution. And we're going to be diving in to how you as a business owner need to start thinking about contracts and legal services in your business and how you can start using AI right now to level up your game. Robert, Thank you for joining me and welcome to Mentors Collective. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate you having me. I appreciate you lending your expertise here in a subject that most of us uh, undervalue sometimes. We're focused on making money and selling and marketing. You forget about some of the stuff that is protecting you or that could be hanging over your head as a liability. So Ro Robert, tell me briefly why entrepreneurs and business owners need to take contracts seriously. Can you? And I'd love to hear some anecdotes some, some horror stories of things that you've been involved in. Why are contracts well, look, important? Well, look, I mean, contracts are important in every business, uh, but they're most important in IT and software and tech-oriented businesses where data privacy and security and other risks uh, have emerged in a way that, you know, doing business on a handshake is no longer acceptable. You know, if you if you paint houses in your neighborhood, you could probably paint those houses without an, uh, an involved contract. But if you're providing IT services or software services for other companies that may or may not be regulated, then you wind up in a situation where contracts become extremely important to mitigating risk. Can you tell me an example of some a client that you worked with that may have not had their legal situation straightened out and what happened in that case? Scare, scare some of the audience members here. What, what can happen if you do neglect legal in your business? Well, look, in my business, you know, a lot of my clients are in the, in the managed services and IT space. Mm. And you know, there's numerous cases that I've been involved with where because of a failure of a hardware device or something, uh, the the service providers' clients wind up with lost data, mm. and then the question becomes, you know, how does that data come back, and who's responsible for it? And you know, for example, you know, I had a client that was in the cloud solutions business, offering cloud solutions to tax preparers, and they had a drive on a RAID fail, and then they had another drive on that RAID fail, and all of the tax returns for three CPA firms were lost. Wow. If you know anything about how taxes get done, accountants start with last year's return and roll it forward. If you don't have any of last year's returns, you're starting over. So these uh, firms were you know, injured significantly by uh, the failure of the array. And it also turned out that the backups weren't performing well. So, I can imagine that was a massive liability. Oh my God. What was the result of that? What, how did so that turn out? Fortunately, that particular service provider had our uh, agreements in place, which contain a limitation of liability, which is, you know, at that time was for that particular agreement was six months of fees paid. So although these accounting firms alleged that they were injured in the hundreds of thousands, the right. agreement limited the liability to six months of fees paid by each one of the firms. And what so, would have been the case, do you think, if, if they didn't have a, a contract? They would have been completely exposed for the full amount. The, the only real defense that we had in those cases was the limitation of liability. So can a company be put out of business in a, in a case like that? What would happen? Yeah, in, in the average company who suffers a data breach or cyber attack uh, the average amount of time that they stay in business after such an attack is six months. So it's not only the case that people can go out of business from cyber attacks, is that they generally do go out of business, and it happens relatively quickly. That's particularly if you don't have insurance, and particularly if you don't have the appropriate contractual provisions to hold other people accountable for anything that they might have done to cause the harm.
Yes, insurance. That's another one of the things that I always kind of brushed off because it wasn't directly revenue generating. And it's one thing that Scott, when we, we were probably about a year in when he's like, you know, we're making a lot of money. We've got employees now. We should cover our butts and protect this business. So we loaded up on insurance and we hired two different legal firms on retainer to come and iron out all of our contracts. And I mean, God forbid we haven't been sued yet, but when we are, we, ha we have that protection, that peace of mind, knowing that we do have insurance. And if we are sued, they're going to have to beat iron tight contracts. So I guess the question becomes, you know, if it wasn't for Scott, I don't know if we would even have contracts and insurance now because it was just never a thought in my mind. But in your opinion, Robert, when do you think it's a good idea for business owners and entrepreneurs to start thinking about these things, to start looking for a legal firm? When? Well, look, I think that part of the issue is affordability. And that's what we started with Monger to really create a more affordable solution. You know, many of the clients in the IT services space are relatively small firms. Yes. You know, we, were, we were charging twelve to $15,000 fees on our traditional model to implement their customer contracts. And frankly, many of the, the people in the market couldn't afford it. So, you know, as you're smaller, it's important to figure out how you can go about getting affordable solutions in place right away. You know, for your first deal, you need an agreement. Uh, you don't need to go spend outsized money to get an agreement. But the idea of doing business in this climate with no agreements is, is, is too risky, regardless of the industry that you're in. So what I suggest to people is you need to find a solution that fits your business size. You know, a lot, you know, giant businesses go to giant law firms. Small businesses do business with law firms that are set up to offer services to smaller firms. Um, Cloud-enabled solutions like Monger are, decide, are designed to make legal services more affordable across the board so that it can reach more smaller companies and startups. So that's a really good kind of talking point. As a small business, where do you go for those low-cost legal services that work? And Monger, I know, is targeted for IT professionals. How does it work? How are you able to offer those legal services at a lower cost for, for those startups? And so small first, first of all, you know, a lot of the work and the value is developed over a 20 year career mm. of hundreds of engagements where we've seen what can happen to, to people. And we we build those into the agreements. So, for example, I told you earlier about the tax accounting firms that had their data lost. Mm. Well, after that case, I added a provision in our master services agreement that says unless otherwise specified, the customer has an obligation to retain their own backups. Because with that type of provision in there, if there was a data loss, the provider could argue, okay, but you have your independent backup, so no harm, no foul. Right. Um, so it's those types of things that get into the agreements. And what we've done is we've taken all that history, we've gone and gotten copyright registrations on all the forms, and then we've reimagined our traditional legal service as a SaaS solution where the, where the technology, the IP, and the underlying approach is the delivery of these uh, industry-leading templates that we customize for each client in a 30-day setup and keep dynamically updated for changes in the law and in the industry. And the way we're able to deliver it is through a technology platform and process driven off of templates that have been curated for a long time so that when you get the right client that fits this industry, the need for customization is very low. And so therefore right. the number of hours is low. The other thing that we've done is we've been able to spread the cost that we used to charge all up front. Now we spread that over three years. And so the wow. client not only gets the benefit of a lower entry point, they're getting a much more comprehensive service that includes frequent updates of their agreements so that they never get out of date. Whereas before we would deliver our email, we would deliver our agreements via email and word processing and they would get stale. And I had no tech platform to push the recommended changes. And so the as a service model, not only lowers the barriers to entry 
for the smaller firms to get the comprehensive legal protections. It preserves the ability to customize for each customer, and it features through a long-term recurring revenue agreement, dynamic updates to keep all of the contracts up to date. That's so important. And we've been updating our contracts probably every other month and it takes a lot of work, but contracts do go stale. And that's something I know from experience, but would never expect that to be the case. Mm -hmm. And it makes a lot of sense being able to serve a specific type of client because you, I guess when you're, when you're developing a contract for the first time, I don't know what angle my enemy is going to come at me from. And only by doing this for years and years, are you going to see all those angles and anticipate them and be able to put them into a template. And that's why I guess it makes a lot of sense not to go about like a do it yourself model going on like rocket lawyer or chat GPT and say, write me a contract that covers this, this, and this, because you probably don't know what you don't know. You don't know all the angles of what you need to probably protect yourself with. So that's, that's helpful. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and the thing with templates and is similar to using large language models, mm -hmm. you know, the problem with that is if you're not a lawyer, then you really don't know when the chat or the template is wrong and needs to be changed. Right. I recently wrote an article using chat GPT four, ironically on how to get a copyright registration in the United States for works containing, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, generated in part with artificial intelligence. And I had ChatGPT assist me with the drafting of that article. And on the key point, the critical legal point, it got it completely wrong. And you'd never but know unless you were a lawyer. Unless you know, unless you know, um, it can be very damaging to use these tools. And what I say is this. Um, the best way to leverage technology is put it in the hands of the best lawyers. Yes. And that's why Monger is so focused on AI because we're trying to train the AI to do that work that we've been doing for all these years, but to do it faster. So today I can analyze a master services agreement and compare it to our master template using AI in a fraction of the time that it would have taken me before to read, analyze, and digest that and send a summary to the client. So it, historically what's happened with technology and law, we've, we've talked in terms of legal and, and legal tech as being alternatives. You either go to a lawyer or you go to LegalZoom. You either go to a law firm or you go to Rocket Lawyer. Well, Monger is totally different than that. Monger is designed to be legal tech for law firms, designed to deliver uh, what was already traditional expertise, you know, sort of known for expertise, but bringing that SaaS enabled and AI powered platform to the lawyers that already have developed the best reputations and now take them to the next level through process, through technology, and through preservation of the intellectual property that exists in their forms, which is something that nobody has really ever talked about, which is these lawyers all have these incredibly valuable documents that are written works that they've yeah. created and they give them away for free in exchange for hourly rates or fixed fee engagements. So as a marketing agency owner, so if I'm an IT business owner, no question, you go to, you go to Monger, you get all of that expertise. Now, say you're in any other industry. Do you have any recommendations for where to point those people to find the Monger equivalent for that industry? Where do they go? So I think there will be many more options in the future. Today, there are very few. Hmm. Uh, the Monger platform does cover managed services for IT, IT consulting, software as a service, software development, uh, and digital marketing. So let me talk to you about some things that may be important to you. Please. So let's say you guys decide to do some um, digital ads management for your customers, say Google ads or Reddit ads or LinkedIn ads, and something bad goes happen, something bad on the, goes wrong on the account, it gets hacked or some settings are made in a certain way that the budgets are adjusted and you have a client that is 
it approved you to spend ten thousand per month on digital ads, and one month their ad spend is a hundred. You're managing their ad spend. You go to them and, and you know they get their bill, and it's like ninety grand more than they're expecting. They call you Jay and say, Jay, what the hell? This is ninety thousand. I wasn't expecting to spend. What happened? So when it comes to digital marketing, you've got a lot of risks that are very specific to your industry that you need to worry about. In addition, with digital marketing, you need to get your customers to protect you from things like copyright infringement. You know, often in a digital marketing firm, customers are sending you content. And if you don't make them represent and warrant that they're the owners of that content and have them agree that you won't be responsible for any copyright or intellectual property related claims against you, then you're exposed. Uh, and so I, I think that the risk associated with doing business is different for every kind of business, like you said. And, and that's why we only deal with a very limited subset of types of engagements that we're very familiar with. Right. But Jay, I would tell you that today there are very few options uh, that are heavily uh, technology oriented, but that are delivered through law firms. But Sounds I like think a great that business opportunity for lawyers out there who have been specializing in marketing agencies for a long time to go and start one of these niche AI driven legal firms. I, I would hire them in a second for our marketing agency. And thank you for that insight. Wonderful. Uh, now, Rob, you mentioned that our clients need to protect us by confirming that they own something. And there's a lot of different, I guess, layers or a lot of different levels at which they can approve something or sign an agreement or agree to, to, to terms. And we see it every day in like apps that we sign up for, little check boxes, I agree to the terms, things that pop up. And a lot of those, I guess, hold different weight and value if it were to go to court. Uh, we've come up with our own way of kind of getting our clients to agree to things. There's, you know, the, the terms on WooCommerce that they click, check the box. Obviously that's not strong enough for, for what it is that we do. So we have them physically sign, uh, on a, on a form that they're filling out, but there's the docu signs. There's a lot of the contract softwares that are popping up that are similar to docu sign. I'm wondering, Rob, what qualifies as. Uh, an agreement that will be binding enough to to hold up in court. What should you be getting your customers to do? What action should they take to protect you? I think there's a number of factors that go into the question of when a digital contract is formed mm -hmm. and under what circumstances a provider um, who uses digital contracting could be subject to an argument by a customer in the event of a dispute that the contract wasn't properly formed. Uh, and I would say that in general, if you're in the B2B space, yes. you know, dealing with sophisticated business owners, the level of scrutiny that the courts will put on these topics is less than if you're a giant corporation dealing with consumers. Right. But in general, you know, contract formation principles are, are, are established long ago in the common law, and it's, you know, a knowing and full assent to the terms and an indication of a willingness to be bound. There's no, you know, particular requirement that you affix your signature with a pen, right? Yeah. Clicking a box can be the affirmative action that indicates assent. Similarly, you know, there's no requirement that the contract be written on paper. It can be presented in HTML on a website. It can be in a PDF accessed through a link. Right. You see the napkin, so, the napkin it, contracts in TV shows and movies. And in, in and in law school, in the law books, they teach they talk about you know, right. a three a three word uh, napkin. Is that a contract? And it can be. And that's the point of those. And so, what's important from a from a digital contracting perspective is number one, you need the right agreements. Number two, they have to be written in, in plain English and easily accessible and, and you can't make people jump through hoops to get to them. Uh, and, and then number three, 
uh, they need to sign it. They, there needs to be some way. It could be click to accept. It can be pretend you have a signature. It can be a number of different things. In general, the law is well settled that tools like DocuSign, EchoSign, PandaDocs, and the equivalents all um, can be used to enter into valid contracts and the ability to escape one of those contracts that you signed would be very difficult, particularly in light of the fact that many times they track you to your IP address and yes. a number of other things that if you said it wasn't you, they've got ways to, to deal with that. Um, and so I think that the, the digital age is upon us and anyone who's not contracting online because they're afraid of contract formation issues is really behind the times because there's plenty of legal support for online contracting. And what we do, and I know that's the way you do it, is the key is, you know, you combine your online contracting with your online sales with Monger. Yeah. We deliver our legal services directly into our clients' sales quotes, CRMs, and websites. We don't deliver them via word. You know, our online terms and conditions live and integrate with our client's sales processes so that when the client accepts the online um, quote or proposal, all of the legal terms and conditions are entered into at the same time. Interesting. So the checkbox in many cases does qualify as a binding legal agreement. Uh, so in what cases do you think it's, I guess, worth using versus an actual contract? Because I always assume that say I ever go to battle with TikTok about some kind of data usage, I don't even, I don't know what I signed. Nobody does. We, when we sign up for the app, you click the box and you just assume that if anything goes wrong, the law is still going to be on your side because obviously I didn't read it. What are your thoughts there? I think that's a problem, um, especially for a business. Like if you're going to go get on TikTok, you're going to get on with their terms and conditions and you're going to live with that, right? Mm. So that's why I say B2C, a lot different kind of deal. But if you're going to pitch a, a new client on a substantial, you know, digital marketing and PR campaign, uh, you need to have that in writing. And I would say a mere click wrap is probably not the best way to do it. Although yes. we use click wraps in conjunction with other types of contracting, including e-signature and what we call browser wrap. And, and browser wrap is a tool that, really empowers the digital transformation when it comes to contracting because what it says is that the provider may update the terms and conditions and give the customer notices of the update and you've seen this jay in your inbox because you read these emails that say in order to serve you better we've updated our terms and conditions and here's a summary yep. of what's changed and we do that same thing for our customers interesting okay very good uh, Robert, what is the role of AI right now in, in the legal world? Obviously, you're utilizing it as a legal provider, but there's other ways that people are using it right now as a legal consumer, whether it to be writing contracts. A big way that I use it is reading them because I mean, I, I'm faced with contracts at least once a week that I'm unsure about whether I should sign it or not. So what are some ways that you're using AI in legal? What are some ways consumers can think about using it and where do you see it going? Yeah. Um, AI and legal is going the same place that AI in every other industry is going. It's going to be everywhere and nowhere mm. in the sense that it's going to be built into everything that we do, everything that we interact with, right, is going to be AI driven. In the legal industry, the most ground, you know, aside from large language, you know, prior to large language models, uh, we were making a lot of progress in the legal industry and AI in terms of document reviews, hmm. you know, artificial intelligence and e-discovery platforms that would enable one lawyer to review, you know, volumes and volumes of, you know, discovery data. You know, that's been around for a number of years and has really transformed the efficiency of lawyers in the context of litigation. Similarly, in the area of legal research, you know, there's two primary uh, companies that are in the service of providing legal research tools to lawyers, Thomson and Reuters and LexisNexis, both huge conglomerates, both with tremendous tech budgets, and both platforms have used AI 
uh, for many years to streamline uh, the legal research process for law. What's Are changed different... dramatically yeah, go ahead. Uh, recently is large language, and, and in mm. particular, chat GPT and other programs of its type. Uh, some people may not know that chat GPT has passed the bar exam in many states, um, but it's still not an attorney. And for someone like you, I would caution, it's okay for you to use chat GPT to summarize a contract, but I use it every day and it misses lots of stuff. And so I would say trust but confirm, use it as a tool. Don't use it as a substitute for calling your lawyer. And as law evolves, you know, lawyers are going to be training AI tools. So in the large corporate world right now, outside counsel are being hired to train the AIs in, in, inside the corporate legal departments. And that's right. a big growth area, right? Um, AI will also be instrumental in allowing lawyers to perform legal review of contracts in a fraction of the time. The reason you're trying to do it yourself is you don't want to send it to a lawyer and get a huge bill, right? You're right. But, but what if you had a lawyer that could price it for you in such a way that it's cheaper than the time that you spend on it because they're using tools that you have and more and they have the expertise such that they can now deliver those reviews to you in a, in a faster than you could do it yourself and at a cost that is lower or closer to your opportunity cost for your own time. That'd be amazing. And I think about that, sending it to a lawyer who specializes in marketing agencies that's already trained in AI on what to look for in contracts, specifically what they already know that people are going to be sneaking into agreements and how they're going to be sneaking it into the agreements because I don't know those things and I don't know how to prompt for it. So yeah, Rob, I, I hope that becomes a, a common practice and a business that's available to us in the next year, hopefully. But yeah, you're right. I don't want to spend the time sending it to a lawyer, paying you know all of his research fees because he's probably going to maybe use AI and claim that he's not or not use AI, which could be even worse. And it's going to leave, leave you in a hole and it's going to leave you delayed by days or weeks uh, to, to read and write that contract. Uh, and, so you know, as a business owner, the last thing you want to do is, and I know this for myself, I'm in sales in some ways myself. The last thing you want to do is send a contract somewhere to die or to, you know, <laughs> to just sit, you know, so. Yes. And, and so what I think is happening is that AI will be used to accelerate not only the responsiveness of law firms, it will speed the work. So I have AI tools now, Jay. I could program alternative clauses and do all these things, and I could actually supervise the AI while it redlines your agreement, wow. quickly review it and send it to you in a fraction of the time that it used to take. And so I think now with AI, lawyers can actually deliver the services that you want. And what I mean by want, quickly, affordably, in a way that drives value, even for relatively smaller contracts. But the idea of this whole back and forth and the traditional approach of the way legal services were done really made it to where small businesses don't want to fool with it. It's only really available to large corporations that, you know, have the means to, you know, hire tons of lawyers. And in a lot of ways, AI's, AI will democratize legal services. The risk is what you've described, is that people who have no expertise will start using AI and think it's protecting them, but the AI owes you no duty. If it gets you, if it, gets you it wrong, there's no insurance behind that, right? You, you have no one to blame but yourself. Mm -hmm. So, so the, I think the real future for AI and, and law is that the best lawyers need to get platforms that will empower this service model that you're describing, which is lightning fast, AI powered, and cheap enough to where you're going to want to send every agreement instead of doing it yourself. Right. And I, I think like every other industry, if you don't adopt it, you're going to get left in the dust because you're going to be able to scale your services at a rate and a cost that's much faster and cheaper than other legal firms have been doing it the traditional way. So good on you adopting it. 
I guess the question everybody always wants to know when you talk about AI implementation across different industries is who's out of work. Obviously, you become a, a, a super powered lawyer by using this. But for every one of you, I feel like somebody else or some other people may be out of work. Who is that? Well, I would say in particular, AI is in the short run is not going to take your job for most people. But people who use AI will take your jobs quickly. Mm -hmm. so, so if you're not using AI, you're, I just see it in my own firm. I have lawyers that work for me that don't use AI, and I run circles around them in terms of efficiency, productivity, capabilities, responsiveness. And so AI is not going to take a lot of people's jobs, and in the near term, it won't be taking any lawyer's jobs, because I would submit to you that most of the do-it-yourselfers right now using AI to do it themselves, weren't hiring lawyers before. Yeah. Um, so, so the question becomes, you know, for lawyers, what is it about AI that is going to be interesting? So there's two roles for lawyers. The one role is for the experienced lawyers to know when it gets it wrong. Someone's got to review these outputs. Someone still has to put their name on the advice or the documents. And with right. their name rides their reputation and their insurance policy. So guys like me in their 50s, been practicing law since, you know, almost 30 years. Um, and we're going to be OK because we're going to know when the AI gets it wrong. Yes. For the younger lawyers, I think it's going to be a challenge because guys like me don't need a lot of associates to go write up memos and, and make first drafts. Those roles are almost gone or will right. be soon. So, so what is the role for the, for the associate attorney? Well, training of AI models. There's a lot of work with AI in the law, and I do it every day, you know, splitting things and prompt engineering and, you know, cutting and pasting from outputs to build documents and so forth. You know, the younger lawyers are going to be using AI to build a first draft so that guys like me don't have to do all the prompting and cutting and pasting to get something that's cohesive to review. So that's what they'll be doing. And then guys like me will be looking at it and determining, did they get it right or wrong? Or is there a different thing that we need to add that they missed? So I'm old enough to have seen the evolution in law from typewriters to word processors to fax machines to emails, and now AI-powered solutions delivered through cloud directly into your sales agreements and your e-commerce platforms and your, and your websites is the next evolution of all of that. And every time it happened, there was some dislocation. There were some lawyers that got left behind, and this will be no different. It's just going to happen much faster than those other technical changes that I described. I have to say, it's impressive. You mentioned you're in your 50s, you've been doing this for several decades, and people growing up with AI now are taking prompt engineering classes. They're gonna be learning how to train AI in college. What is your advice to professionals who are, are your age in their mid 50s and they're seeing AI coming and they might be scared and confused, but don't really know what to do, how to adopt it? How did you adopt it? How did you look at it? And what's your advice to those people? Well, the, fir the first thing that, that I think is important is just play with it. You know, yeah. go to ChatGPT or any of the other large language models and start playing around with it. And then when you see the power of it, start asking it to write some things for you. And then when it starts writing some things for you, Start uploading some things that you may have written that are not proprietary and confidential, but you want to see the power of its capability of doing reviews. Uh, upload your pleadings that are filed. There's a number of things that you could do just to get started that don't require any more than either a free license or a $20 a month license. And you have nothing to lose by giving it a try. And I think that what you'll see is what everyone else has seen is that this is the most awe-inspiring technology that you'll ever see or that you've ever seen. Uh, that's why 200 million people downloaded ChatGPT in a short period of time. So that would be number one. 
Number two, if you're a lawyer and you're trying to figure out how to incorporate AI into your practice, is really a number of ways to think about it. One is, does it help you do intake? Does it help you review prospective cases or contracts or deals or whatever it is that you do? Does it accelerate your ability to get ready to talk to a prospective client, to be more prepared, to be um, armed with more to show them about what your capabilities are than maybe another lawyer that they may be interviewing? So it's the intake process that you want to be thinking about. How can you in make it more likely that a client will engage you because of the way you've used AI to prepare for your first meetings. That would be one area. Then beyond that, you want to start thinking about how can AI impact your delivery? And when it comes to large language models, every lawyer writes things. And so start using AI to write things for you. You have to be very careful as a lawyer about client confidentiality, and there's a number of things that you need to be cautious about before you start loading client data in. So I would say before you feel totally comfortable with that, make sure that you are using non-confidential public data. That's why I said put your pleadings in there. Those are public, right? It's public information. Use it to draft a letter. Don't use the client name. Say, client, I need to write a, a letter for client A. Client A is in a business dispute with a company B. Company B did this or that. So be generic when you're dealing with the large language models to preserve client confidentiality. But, not, but think about, aside from writing, what can it do to help you analyze large volumes of data? I mentioned the area of e-discovery. That's a huge one. Um, but there's other areas that are still emerging, right? What Monger does is it uses the AI on the front end because clients come to us and say, what legal protections will I get from you that I don't have today? So we use AI to do a comparison of their current agreements against ours. And I'll do this for you, Jay, if you send me yours. Deal. I'll do an AI driven comparison between what your current agreements say and what the Monger templates would provide for you. And we have the large language models doing side-by-side -side comparisons and evaluating them from a number of perspectives, including cybersecurity risk and other aspects. So what would take me hours to get ready for a first time appointment, now I can do in minutes. And when I get to the appointment, I've got a very, very well-prepared analysis of the client's agreements and how they compare to what they would expect to receive from us. And so, Again, as you start moving toward these process-driven models, it becomes critically important to make sure that you can scale. You don't have, you know, I used to have one or two client conferences a day. Now I have eight. So how are you going to be ready to do the amount of work that's necessary to properly prepare for a prospective client meeting without having tools that really can accelerate that review? So think about that. Then on the backside, I use large language models to compare and analyze and make improvements to our templates. You know, our mm -hmm. templates were written by us. That's why they're copyrightable. But I still use AI to constantly challenge and constantly look at how we can make them better. I don't have it write the language because I want to preserve the copyrightability of our forms. But I take what it says in terms of its analysis, and then we make edits from there, human drafted. So there's a number of ways to use AI and legal. There's a bunch of tools out in the market for lawyers that do transactional work. Um, and, and if you're not using AI, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. If you're not using AI, it's just a short amount of time before your job will be taken by people who do. I'm with you 100%. Uh, and thank you for explaining that. I think you laid it out step by step exactly what people need to think about, especially lawyers, when it comes to implementing AI into their practices. I think that's going to help a lot of people. Uh, now, briefly, Rob, I'd love to touch on Monjuro, especially for those IT owners who might be listening to this. 
we talked a, a bit about different aspects of Mondro, about how you execute the business model, the, the value that you're able to provide be, because of the expertise and the prompt engineering and AI training. But who is it really for? Who, who, do you, who is your perfect client? Our clients are owners of IT services firms, software firms, and digital marketing agencies hmm. uh, that, are, that are in uh, locations in the United States and Canada who are interested in moving to online contracting, leveraging digital sales platforms like CRMs and e-commerce sites, but want a law firm that's familiar with these fields so that they can manage, so that they can start with these industry leading templates, have them customized for their business in a way that's very cost effective relative to just the traditional legal service model. And then someone who's responsible for keeping them updated. And, and so our clients are IT services firms, anyone in the channel, any software firms that want need software licensing agreements, data processing and regulatory compliance agreements, and the digital marketing agencies that need contracts that go into the types of risks that I was talking about, like your AdWords account goes nuts and the client has a $100,000 bill or there's a lawsuit over some marketing materials that you prepare and now you're embroiled in a case. So those are the types of things that become very important. And, and we're not going after the giant companies. You know, the giant companies, if you've got, you know, a hundred million in revenue, you're likely not looking for bond. Right. Monitor is really a service for clients that have one to 10 million in, in revenue, which in the IT services space and in the SaaS space and in the digital marketing space happens to be the majority of all of those businesses. Thank you. What, what does the workflow look like? Say I was interested in, in hiring Monitor. What, what process am I going to flow through in order to engage your company and then get value and continue working with Monitor? What does that look like? So it starts with a, it starts with some Zoom meetings and, and just consultations and discovery around what exactly do you need from a legal perspective? It would be very similar to the type of discussion I would have with a client traditional. It's like, you know, what markets are you in? Who are your clients? You know, how do you charge? You know, what's the term of your typical engagement? What's the value of your typical engagement? What size businesses do you deal with? What regulated industries do your clients come from? So it would be very similar in that way. And then we build out a very specific library for you of templates that we then would customize for you in our 30-day setup process. So you come on to Monger, we get everything configured exactly the way you want it. You pay a small setup fee, you agree to uh, you know monthly recurring payments, and then we walk you through based on our industry leading templates, a customization process over a 30 day period where we're taking things from you specific to your business, things that are your payment terms, for example, may be different than the next guy, right? So we're doing all that for 30 days. And then what we do is we look at your CRM, we look at your quoting solution, your website, and then we do what we call integration. You know, our mm -hmm. integration is we're building our legal framework into your existing sales process. So that's Very integration cool. for us. So we do that. We review the first two quotes and proposals that go out to make sure all that's linked up correctly and working well. And then if you have a, a, a question, a client raises a question about your agreements, then a review of those requested customer changes is also included in our maintenance and support. Oh, that's huge too. Yeah. So you're Very not going to cool. be paying you're not going to be paying a lot of hourly fees that are, you know, could be disproportionate from the opportunity. They could be um, uh, a disconnection between cost and value could come later than you need it. With the Monger platform, initial customer reviews are included. Why? Because with this model, our clients are reporting that up to 99% of the quotes that go out they click the button to accept the quote, and there's no discussion of the legal documents whatsoever. So it's easy for me to offer it included because I know based on now almost 200 active subscribers that we're not going to get a lot of them. 
That's amazing. One, I guess, horror story that we had when we first started, we engaged a law firm and it was a friend from college who was part of a bigger law firm. And we were sending them work for probably a month before we actually got a bill for it. And that bill that we got, oh my God, we negotiated it down, but they weren't transparent the entire time. So the hourly retainer model is just so painful for new companies that I can't encourage enough people to go look for alternative solutions. And I didn't even know something like this existed. So thank you. Thank you for sharing it, Rob. Thank you for creating this company. I hope other lawyers follow in your footsteps. Where can listeners go to talk to you, to sign up for Mondra, to get more information? So I think the best place to go is Mondra.com. You can read about our philosophies, our approach. You can see what you know, documents are there for, for available for us. You can schedule a demo there. Um, that would be an, a, a good way to do it. You could also just reach out to me via email at Rob S at Mondra.com. That's M O N J U R.com. Uh, but I'd love to talk to anybody who's interested in these topics. I'm obviously very passionate about the transformation of, of legal services in light of uh, SaaS enabled and AI powered tools like Mondra. And um, very willing to talk to anybody who has any interest in these areas. And I especially would like you to send me your agreement so I could show you how our AI co-counsel we call Lobby can do an analysis of your agreements and show you how we could offer you much more comprehensive legal protections than you have today. Oh, I'm excited to see it. No, Scott's going to go crazy when I, when I let him know. And thank you for giving your email. I'll, I will link that in the podcast notes. Thank I think you. with my audience, you shouldn't get too many crazy people coming in there, but you I'm never sure know. That. So be forewarned. Rob, thank you so much for joining me. I learned a lot about uh, legal on this episode. It was very entertaining too. I love how AI is affecting different industries. So thank you for sharing your expertise there. Yeah. And I'll send you over some agreements. Let's have some fun. Let's do it. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Jay.